Hello, everyone. Welcome to church. Did everyone enjoy their extra one hour sleep in? Or extra one hour to get ready in? No, the people with the babies are saying no. The babies don't recognise daylight saving ends today. (laughs) Well, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Please stand. So we're going to start our service with a couple of songs. worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging seas, my God, he holds the victory. There is joy in the house of the Lord, there is joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet, we shout out. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolls these storms away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in his way. Be quiet. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're right and free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. Omniscient, all knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than die. Darkness, new every morn. Our sins they are many. His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? 
He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins and our many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins they are many, His mercy is more. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more Sins they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Uh, can I encourage you to take a seat as we uh, begin our time together this morning? I want to Pastor, my hearty welcome to you, uh, particularly if it's your first time. If I haven't met you in person, my name's Phil, and I've got the pleasure of leading us through our service this morning. It's great to gather as a church uh, to worship and glorify the Lord, the risen Jesus. And we did have the pleasure last week of celebrating Easter, the resurrection um, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was an amazing, it was a huge event, our biggest on record. Um, so if you were here with us celebrating that time, uh, it's great to have you back this week. Um, if you're new today or joining us uh, from the first time last week, an extra special welcome to you. Um, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. And the best way to do that is if you just pop out to the info hub out in the foyer after the service. Please introduce yourself to the people out there and uh, they'll you know, get to find out a little bit about your story and then hopefully you can find out a little bit more about us here at Menai. Uh, well, this morning, um, I guess here at Menai, we love uh, to long to see people um, find life and uh, hope in Jesus Christ. And it's great that we can do that together. We can worship together. We can read God's word. Um, we can pray to him. And we just love connecting each Sunday morning here. So welcome. Welcome. Uh, this morning actually is our finale in the book of John, and I hope, like me, you've been challenged and encouraged all at the same time uh, as we've looked through those last words that Jesus has shared with his disciples, how good has that been as we've walked through that together. Uh, Stefan's going to continue uh, and finish us off today as he explains from John um, more about Jesus' words to his disciples, uh, so look forward to that, and we also get to share in the Lord's Supper. Now, you might have got these little tiny thimbles uh, of grape juice as you came in. Uh, that's for us to share communion later on. So just hold on to those. Maybe put them under your seats uh, somewhere safe. Uh, if you didn't get one, there'll be time to grab those um, before we get into communion. Uh, but before that, there's a couple of things that are happening in the life of our church that I would love to draw your attention to. And the first one of those is Camp One. And it should come up on a slide because it's awesome. And it's awesome for so many reasons. Here you go. Staring at the ceiling. Two weeks and I'll be home. Carry the feeling. Through Paris, all through Rome. And I'm still thinking. 
thinking back to the time under the canyon. Who's pumped? Youth, is, are you pumped for Camp One? I think that was just the parents. So, look, it's it's really a win-win. Um, you know, you've got either the option of uh, having your kids at home in that holiday mode of I'm bored, I don't know what to do, or you can send them to Camp One, right? So the kids, you should be pumped about Camp One. They look like so much fun. Uh, we'll have over a hundred youth there. Connor and the team are putting in so much work into the program. It'll be super exciting. Um, so I'm pumped for it. I know um, at least my two kids are pumped for it, and uh, I'm pumped to only have one kid left at home. So look, as I said, win-win. Um, what do you need to know, parents? Well, uh, Rego's close next Sunday, the 14th. So you don't want to miss out and then have your kids at home while every other kid at church is there, and then they come back from camp and say, Mum, Dad, why didn't you send me? Right? So... Look, nothing like a plug that's also is funneled in guilt, right? So, um, but you get the, you get the joy of um, having your kids encouraged and challenged in the word, making friends, fun, friends and memories. So super exciting. Uh, the second thing that's going on in the life of our church, um, we are a church that seeks to see people of Menai uh, understand who Jesus is and find life in him. But we also want to reach out and support churches that do that across our nation and across the world. And so um, once every uh, quarter, we run an event um, where we get to hear more about what our mission partners are doing. Uh, this quarter, it is Fall Into Prayer. Um, and so you get to hear about the 10 different mission partners that we support. And uh, you can do that next Sunday afternoon from 4 till 5.30. Uh, we'd love to see you there to find out more information and to support them, um, those mission partners in prayer. Um, again, if you need any more information, uh, ask at the Info Hub. Uh, otherwise, we'll look forward to seeing you there uh, next Sunday afternoon, 4 o'clock. Be there. Now, men, I, we love our kids, as you saw, the youth being, you know, full of joy and being challenged by the word. Uh, and so I have the privilege of inviting Kelly up, um, who's our uh, children's minister, and she's going to share our kids' spot for us this morning. So let's welcome Kelly up as she comes. Good morning, everybody. Well, it's lovely to see you today. And guess what? We have made it to the last chapter in the book of John. Hasn't it been an exciting adventure? And guess what I'm going to do today? I'm going fishing. In the last chapter of the book of John, the disciples are in a boat out on the lake, and they have been out there all night, and they've been fishing. The way they fished was not with a fishing rod. They had a net, and they threw their net in over the side of the boat, and then they pulled it up, and they threw it in, and they pulled it up, but no fish. Again and again, all night, no fish. Peter sat down in the boat, and he remembered another day, just like this day, where him and his brother had gone fishing on the lake, and they had thrown their nets in no fish, not even one fish. And then a man had come walking along the shore, and he told them, throw your nets in just one more time. But Peter and his brother were fishermen. There weren't any fish but they threw their net in one more time. And all of a sudden, all this fish came from everywhere. And it was Jesus. And Peter knew on that day that this was not an ordinary man. And Jesus said, follow me, and Peter did. But then Peter failed Jesus. 
Peter said, not once, not twice, but three times. I don't even know him. And then Jesus had died. And Peter had not got the chance to tell Jesus how sorry he was. And so here they were again, no fish. And so they decided to go back to shore. But as they were going back to shore, and the sun was rising in the distance, there was a man on the shore, and he said, friends, have you caught any fish? And Peter said, not even one. And the man said, throw your net in again on the right. Can't hurt. And so they got their net, and they threw it in one more time. And then all of a sudden, there was fish coming from everywhere, so many fish, they couldn't even pull it up. And then they knew who it was. It was Jesus. And so Peter did something he'd done before. He did something stupid. He put on his cloak and jumped in the water. But he did that because he was so excited it was Jesus. And he swam to shore. And he left everyone else to drag in this huge net full of fish. And when they got to the shore, Jesus had a fire and he was cooking fish and bread for them. And they sat down silently and they ate with him. Jesus, who had risen again, was there having breakfast with them. But then Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know I love you, Lord. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Not once, not twice, but three times Jesus asked Peter this question. And three times Peter said, you know I love you, Lord. And three times Jesus told him to feed his sheep. And Peter felt hurt because Jesus asked him if he loved him three times. But remember, Jesus, uh, Peter had said, I don't even know Jesus three times. And even though Peter didn't deserve it, Jesus forgave Peter. And for the second time in Peter's life, Jesus said, come and follow me. And that's exactly what Peter did. And Peter spent the rest of his life telling others the good news about Jesus. Now, children, now that we come to the end of John, I have a really important question to ask you. Have you asked Jesus to forgive you for your failures, for all the times you have said no to God and live in your, lived your own way? Because Jesus is the only one who can do that. And if you have asked Jesus to forgive you, then just like Peter, you have a job to do, to go and tell everybody the good news about King Jesus, who died for their sins so they could be forgiven and to love other people who Jesus died for as well. I really enjoyed learning about the book of John with you guys. I hope you have a great holidays, and we will see, I will see you again up here next term. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, it's really exciting to see our kids challenged uh, with the Word of God uh, and encounter those uh, experiences uh, of people who were there who encountered Jesus in the flesh. Now, kids, it is time, but before you go, I'm going to give your parents an instruction and those of us here, because otherwise they won't hear me um, amongst the thunderous footsteps that are about to uh, ensue. And that is, can I encourage uh, those of us that are left uh, to turn around, have a chat with someone uh, next to us, around us, in front of us, behind us for a minute or two as the kids head off. Kids, you know what to do. Go for it. Told me the truth, daddy ain't make me to lose. Yeah, I know I see the news, but she gave me some different views. That's why we speak today, giving strength to the weak today. Be free today, just wanna help you see the way. Don't look down, take that leap of faith. I got a new life, I got a new light that's in my eyes. It's no surprise, my hope is coming from the skies. Look around, my feet is almost off the ground. I heard that trumpet is and now I'm never looking down. Always keep your head. Mama told me, always keep your head up, don't look down, take a good look ahead, see beyond what you see, live life instead, don't go away but up from here, always keep your head up, don't look down, don't look down.
Oh, well, it's um, <clears throat> lovely to hear those conversations. And uh, I am going to have to cut those short. Um, can I encourage you to con continue those conversations after our service uh, over a cup of tea or coffee? It's so great to get to know each other and encourage each other um, in our faith. And uh, so, yeah, just great to hear that uh, conversation going on. Um, it is our great privilege to speak to God in prayer. We have a God who listens, who wants to us to uh, relate to him through prayer. And so in a moment, I'm going to ask Richard to come up uh, and lead us in that time of prayer. Uh, then we'll hear from the Word of God, um, John, and then Ryan will be uh, doing our Bible readings for us this morning. Uh, and then Stefan will be unpacking that for us as he brings the sermon to us. Um, so I'll hand over to Richard to pray for us. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, Phil was just talking about the um, fall into prayer and one of the privileges we have is um, praying for our mission partners. Uh, so, you know, we have mission partners in Africa, um, East, uh, sorry, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, you know, needy places like that. We also have mission partners in very spiritually needy places called Australia. And one of those, pla one of those is um, the Waths, who are from Wollongong, and work in Wickham in Western Australia. And I'm, I'm very fortunate because when I get to pray, often by God's providence, I get the wafts as my you know, pray, sort of prayer partners for the day. And it gives me a chance to just do a little bit more research every time about Wickham and just find out what it's like. Because you think, why would Australia need missionaries? Wickham needs missionaries, and I'll tell you why. Um, you live in Menai, most of you. You're pretty safe living here, in here. You know, this, the, the rate of um, prevalence of you being impacted by violent crime in Menai is about one in 180. In Australia, it's about one in 95. In Loftus, it's one in 230, so I feel sorry for all you people living in Menai. Uh, we're very safe in Loftus. Uh, in Wickham, the chance of you being impacted by violent crime is one in 18. So it's one of the most dangerous places in Australia. Uh, it also has uh, very, very high incomes, like really high. If you look at the, this is all the ABS data. If you look at the incomes in, in Wickham, they're more than double the Western Australian incomes. Western Australia is a mining area, but they're much more than double the Australian. So it tells you that there's something strange going on, isn't there? There's a lot of people with a lot of you know, money from mining, but there's a lot of crime. The other thing is I'm 55 years old, if I live in Wickham, I'm one of the absolute elders in the community, right? There's only, of the people, below, above me, and so there's about 10% of the community above me in, in age, but almost all of them are, below, are between sort of 55 and 60. Essentially what it means is the, the, the challenges of living in Wickham, the health issues, mean people die early, and this happens a lot. And I remember the Waths and the Goscombs previously saying to me, we go to funerals all the time. And these are funerals of people in their 40s. Okay, so it's a challenging environment. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray for them first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our faithful partners in Wickham, Matt and Naomi Wath, and for their personal sacrifices as they enter their year, ninth year in a tough environment. Thank you for the recent growth in the Pilbara Aboriginal Church that Matt encourages and supports each Sunday and for the regular attendances at the Karatha, Anglican and Baptist churches nearby. We pray that your people in the West Pilbara region may have great influence for good in their outback towns. Thank you for Matt's opportunities one-on-one -on -one with the inmates of the Roburn, nearby Roburn prison each week. We pray that staff shortages preventing the large Bible stu stu study group meeting may be resolved soon. Thank you for those men who have benefited from Matt's teaching and kind counsel. We also thank you for Naomi's love for chaplaincy work in the two local schools in Wickham and pray that she will have many gospel opportunities with both staff and children. May both Matt and Naomi do everything in your strength, power and wisdom and may lost people in Wickham be saved by the powerful working of your Holy Spirit. Locally, we thank you, Father, for the amazing work with young people in our church, with Comets and Kids Church. And we pray especially for school scripture and the challenges it continues to face. We ask that in your wisdom, 
You enable young people to come to know you. Thank you for all the faithful scripture teachers, both from our church and many others. Pray that many kids come to know about you. We thank you that the government still encourages and enables scripture in schools, although it's clearly threatened. And Father, we pray for our local school across the road, Lucas Heights Community. We thank you for their first ever Easter service where 30 kids turned up. And we thank you that scripture is now going to be taught for the first time in the high school from term two. <clears throat> Father, we pray for all of those people locally in need, be it spiritual, mental, physical or emotional. We pray that may people look to you in their time of need and find peace, resolution and comfort. But more importantly, may we as your servants be careful and kind to those in need. Help us to be generous to them. Change our hearts so that we are aware when others need us and guide us in ways to serve others. Father, we thank you now for the gifts that are offered to help serve this church and, and the community by our members. May they be used to strengthen your kingdom and your people, be a shining light of your glory in our area. Father, thank you that we are so blessed that we get to hear your word preached faithfully here at Menai. Thank you that as we hear your word today that you speak to us through your divinely inspired words and text. Please help Stefan to speak clearly and truthfully. Each and every one of us will grow as a result of what we hear. In our Father and his Son's name we pray this. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, as we've just heard in our prayers, as we've just prayed, preparing our hearts to hear God's word, I'm going to read out the first uh, reading this morning from Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 22, starting at verse 54. You can follow in your own Bibles or up on the screen. Luke 22, starting at verse 54. Then seizing him... They led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Hi, good morning, everyone. So my name is Ryan. I'll be reading the second New Testament reading this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 15 to 25. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? 
Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Don't take that from me. <laughs> I'm not that good. I need something to lay my notes on. Hi friends, great to see you today. Uh, we've um, come from a, uh, a wonderful term looking at the end of John's Gospel from chapter 13 to chapter 21. And then um, last week, as Phil said, we um, had a wonderful Easter together. And you would have thought that we got to the climax. I mean, Jesus died, that wasn't the climax, although in many ways, theologically, that's the climax. But then um, he rose again and we celebrated that last Sunday. What more could be said? But John read another chapter. Chapter 21, and um, that's what we're looking at today. And I want to say it's a glorious chapter, a really helpful chapter, and it finishes off a lot of what John has been saying all along. So I'm going to pray for us that um, God will keep us attentive, um, that God will help us to uh, understand, but go away from here today changed by what we hear. So let's pray to our Heavenly Father. Father, we do thank you so much uh, for your word to us. We thank you for the Apostle John, and we thank you for uh, the way that he has recorded these um, things so that we would know who Jesus is and what he came to do. And Father, we pray that as we um, see the way that he interacts, uh, Jesus interacts with Peter, that it will help us to see our own lives and what we need to do in response to Jesus. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, ran a Bible study um, group um, for a group of senior men some years ago. Majority of these men were twice my age or more, and many of the men had been in the church longer than I had lived. And so they were seasoned men, and they were used to um, uh, gathering together to read the Word. And we were looking at the book of Ephesians together, and we came to chapter 2. And I said, how good is it that, um, that Jesus' death on the cross is all that we need to be saved by him. And one of the guys, one of the kind of more senior guys that um, was very well respected said, yes, Stefan, how good is it? Um, uh, Jesus' work on the cross um, saves us and the good things that we do. I just kind of let that hang there for a moment. I thought, hang on. I hope alarm bells have gone off in your head. That's not exactly quite right. How good is it that we're saved by Jesus on the cross and the good things we do? So I thought, well, this is one of the um, respected guys, so I better be careful here. So I just decided the best thing to do is just say it again. Just say the truth again. Um, how good is it, I said, um, that um, we're saved by Jesus' death on the cross alone? And he came back pretty quickly afterwards and said, yes, Stephen, it is good that um, we're saved by Jesus' death on the cross and the good things we do. The tennis match has started. The guys watching one watching their friend, then watching Stefan. How's he going to respond? Then watching the guys, how, uh, what's, uh, what's he going to say next? And I thought, well, the only thing I can do here is let's go back to the passage. So we went back to the passage in um, Ephesians 2, and let, I said, well, let's just read that passage again. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. It's true, isn't it? It's all of Jesus. It's all of Jesus. It's none of us. And so it's through what Jesus did on the cross that we're saved by God. And I'm thinking, what's going to come next? Quiet. And then he said, are you saying that the good things that we do, the good things I've um, devoted my life to, have no bearing on being saved by God? It's all about Jesus. Well, the hallelujah chorus went off in my head. Woohoo! He's got it. He's, he's worked it out. But, you know, not wanting, to, um, not wanting to come across as superior in any way, I said, yeah, that's what the Bible says, isn't it? And he sat back in his seat, folded his arms and said, well, I don't believe that. And at that moment, I thought, I've got nowhere else to go here. <laughs> well, the next verse says, and we just kept going, grace, 
it is actually really hard to accept, isn't it? It seems too good to be true. But we need to be reminded of it over and over again because so quickly we will forget it and fall back into the trap of thinking that our status with God is about what we do, not about what Jesus has done. Today we come to the last chapter in John's Gospel and the story of grace in the life of Peter. If you go back to the beginning of John 21, we have several of the disciples returning to something that's very familiar to them. They've gone fishing. A mate of mine, um, a keen fisherman, uh, uh, said that one of the greatest obstacles to him becoming a Christian is, why are all the witnesses to Jesus fishermen? I mean, it's this big and it got away. How can I trust a bunch of fishermen? (laughs) Well, I don't think they were returning to the next to return back to work. Andrew wasn't there. He's one of the keen fishermen, um, uh, Peter's brother. And uh, we had both Thomas and Nathaniel both on the boat. It's likely that Peter just thought, let's get out there. Let's get us a feed. Um, uh, I'll go out and, and do a bit of fishing and get my mind off the amazing events that have gone on in this last little while. Peter, of course... Well, he's got quite a colourful role in the three years of Jesus' ministry. He meets Jesus through his brother Andrew, and he gets a nickname, but it's an odd nickname. For the more we get to know Peter across the words of um, of the Gospels as we have them written, the odder the nickname seems to be. His nickname given to him by Jesus is Rock. But it seems extremely odd because the more we get to know Peter, the less rock-like Peter seems to be. As we get to know Peter, we soon see a man who's unpredictable and impetuous. But a solid rock in times of trouble, he's not the person you would think of when you think um, of the various disciples. He's privileged to be part of the transfiguration, uh, but soon embarrasses himself and um, probably those with him uh, when he's um, felt compelled to uh, to offer Elijah and Moses and Jesus shelters. A bit of a weird thing to say at that moment. He's the one who testifies first that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, but only moments later is rebuked by Jesus with possibly the harshest terms that you could ever imagine. Get behind me, Satan. You have the things of man in mind, not the things of God. Then, in the upper room, which is where we started in chapter 13, um, uh, we saw the washing of the disciples' feet by Jesus. But when Jesus gets to Peter, what does Peter do? You'll never wash my feet, only to be corrected by Jesus, and then say, well, if you're going to wash my feet, wash my hands and my head as well, then to be rebuked by Jesus. In the end, Peter seems to understand so little And yet, for all his lack of understanding, it never stops Peter from boasting. Peter, he's full of self-confidence. And in chapter 13, he says to Jesus, Lord, I will lay down my life for you. But what does Jesus say in response? Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And that's precisely what we heard in that first reading from Luke's Gospel. It's there in John, but I've gone for Luke because it just um, says a little bit more to help us to see what happened at that fateful night on Good Friday, um, or before Good Friday, um, on that night um, that uh, he was before Pilate. It happened once. This man was with him. Woman, I don't know him. Twice. Certainly this fellow was with him. Man, I was not. Three, this man was with me, for he's a Galilean. Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And one of the other Gospels even writes, I never knew him. And at that moment, the rooster crows. Luke records that when Peter denied him the third time, Jesus turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the words that the Lord had spoken, and um, before the rooster crows, you would disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Now take the clock forward a little bit. Imagine what it would have been like for Peter to then see Jesus hung on a cross, on a Roman cross on Golgotha. Imagine what's going through Peter's mind when he hears Jesus say to the disciple John, take care of my mother. 
when he hears Jesus cry from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Only to have his own words, I never knew him, still haunting his mind, Peter, Peter, why have you forsaken me? And can you imagine the sheer awkwardness of the resurrection? Have you ever thought about what it would have been like for Peter in that upper room when Jesus appears and the shame that he must have felt? I mean, of course, Peter would have been full of um, joy because Jesus had risen from the dead. He saw him dead. He's now back alive. But at the same time, can you imagine the regret and the shame that he would have felt? And having those words, woman, I never knew him, ringing around in his ears, and the sound of the rooster crowing and that stare from Jesus burnt into his memory. And so when John turns to Peter in the boat after the catching the great haul of fish and says, it's the Lord, it's actually unsurprising that it's Peter, he's usually impetuous, usually jumps, um, jumps forward and dives in to swim to the shore. What a great kid's talk. You've got the picture. Um, uh, perhaps eager to find out when he got back to shore whether Jesus uh, would somehow take him back when he had denied him in his time of need. Not once, not twice, but three times. Is the one who said you should forgive 70 times 7 willing to practice what he preaches? I wonder if you have found the same question spinning around in your minds. Is there any way back from this? Knowing what nobody else knows about the shame in my past and about that sin in my present. Being aware of having those things in our life that we'd rather die than have anyone know about. Have you ever found yourself asking, would Jesus ever take me back after this? Can the love and mercy of God go that deep? Peter arrives on the shore and he finds Jesus cooking breakfast. Only days before, he had seen him nailed to a Roman cross. He saw the spear enter his side to prove that he was dead. He saw him buried in a cave and now here he is, crouching down on the beach, cooking breakfast for his friends. John writes that when the other disciples landed on the beach, none of them dared ask, who are you? For they knew it was Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator, the Sustainer, the Redeemer, the now risen Lord. They suddenly realise they're in the presence of greatness. Verse 15 to 19 records for us what is at the heart of this passage. The first recorded conversation between Jesus and Peter since Good Friday and his denial of him. The scene is set. Peter is now warming himself around the fire, very reminiscent of the fire that he was warming himself around when he denied Jesus in the courtyard of Caesar. And it's here that Jesus gives Peter three opportunities to affirm his love for him. Verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. More than these? Do you love me more than these? What's the more than these? Is it the fish? That they the 153 or whatever it is, fish that they've just caught? Is it, is it the nets, the, the trade that, Jesus, that Peter's gone back to? Do you love me more than your trade? No, I don't think so. Do you love me more than these other disciples? Which is interesting, we'll come back to in a moment. You confess such love and devotion for me. And you fell far short. You who love to boast of everything you would do for me. Let me ask you, after you've denied me three times, do you still love me more than anyone else? Three times he asked Peter the question, do you love me? Do you love me? Interesting, the third word, do you love me? The third word for love is a, is a slightly different Greek word. But I don't think we can take much of that. John interchanges those words all the time. Knowing that Peter denied him three times, Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Now, why does he ask? Peter himself says in verse 17, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He's hurt when Jesus asks him a third time. He seems to not understand why Jesus is persisting. It's almost as though Jesus didn't believe him. But is it that Jesus just doubts Peter? No. Three times he allows Peter to undo the denials of that fateful evening. In other words, what Jesus is giving Peter is a very gracious and very public expression of forgiveness, a powerful 
expression of grace. I mean, you could imagine the conversation going quite differently than this, couldn't you, over this breakfast? There they are, sitting around the fire, they're eating their brekkie, and Jesus said, well, thanks for nothing, Peter. Where were you when I needed you? Three years of talk and no action when it really counted. He could have said that, couldn't he? Would have been in the right to say that. He may have said something like this, Peter, look, I get it. It was hard on that night. I forgive you. But understand this, I could never trust you again. That's fair. And yet for Jesus, like the story of the father and the lost son that he had told earlier, his love is free and unconditional and full of grace. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. Do you love me? It's quite a lovely and tender story, isn't it? Jesus comes to this man who has failed in such a public and dramatic way and assures him of his forgiveness, of his grace, which Jesus preached and which he practices. Because grace is what lies at the heart of the Christian faith, isn't it? Free, unmerited love, kindness, forgiveness, the unsearchable grace of God. One theologian said that the most astonishing thing about Jesus is not his miracles, but grace. Miracles, he said, breaks the physical laws, but grace breaks the moral laws. That's why I think John finishes his whole gospel with this story. For after all the signs, the miracles, the greatest sign is grace. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Peter had no excuse. I mean, what could he ever bring to Jesus to make up for the fact that he not once, not twice, but three times denied him at Jesus' greatest moment of need? Nothing. But God, who is rich in mercy, saves us. And the question I want us to ask you is, do you believe that? Do you believe that God's grace could even extend to you? Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we've got to admit that grace is hard to accept for us for a number of reasons. We're taught from a young age to work for or earn our place in life. Many of us grew up in families where they demanded that we earn their love. We set ourselves standards, particularly the perfectionists amongst us, and we can't forgive ourselves when we fail. We live with the pressures of expectations, both real and imagined. And we struggle to accept that God could accept us, that we cannot be content and settled and satisfied just as we are. We live in the shadow of our guilt, under the weight of our expectations, but Jesus died to free us from all of that. And that is the gospel, isn't it? Jesus once and for all sacrifice, and like everything God does, it's complete and it's perfect. There's nothing we can add to it. I want to ask you, are you gripped by that grace? Does God's mercy on you make your head spin and take your breath away? Now, I'm guessing that it may have done when you got converted in those early years. But I'm asking you now, are you still gripped by God's grace? For grace is the foundation of every response we have in the Christian life. Are we shaped by grace or are we shaped by something else? In this passage, we get to see what grace does. And the first thing that grace does is that it humbles us. Verse 15, Jesus asks for a comparison. Do you love me, Simon, more than these? More than these other disciples? Are you still ahead of the rest? Because it's always Peter that got in first and boasted of his love for Jesus. Peter that had bragged that he would lay down his life for Jesus. Peter, who talked big and in the process pushed himself ahead of the others. But now Peter's failed and it's changed him forever. Notice his response. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you He doesn't say more than these, does he? He just simply says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
You can almost feel the pain, the humility borne by the conviction of sin in the face of God's grace. Years later, Peter will pen his first letter, and in it he writes these words, All of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud. You can, you can almost imagine him stopping at that moment. God opposes the proud, and look back on his life, and see the so many mistakes he made as a proud man. And how does the verse finish? But gives grace to the humble. You see, it's grace that generates humility because grace reminds every one of us, every man, every woman, every child, that we are sinners before a gracious God. The second thing that grace generates in us is love. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, I realise that we're not so comfortable in Australia, particularly us blokes, talking about emotions. But it's a reaction God uses to express his attitude towards us, and it's the word that the Bible uses for our response to God. Peter, do you love me? And Peter answers, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Why? Because Jesus first loved Peter. You see, the measure of your love for Jesus is how much you've plumbed the depths of Jesus' love for you. Because the Christian life is more than just a matter of the mind. I mean, it is that, but it's also an affair of the heart. A daily falling in love with the God who first loved you. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. You see, that's more than just grasping good doctrine. It is that. It's more than just a clear understanding of Scripture, though it is that too. It's even more than a general commitment just to doing God's will, though that's a big part of it. It's a love for God that renews your mind and which shapes your affections and that drives your will. That's why Paul prays for us and for the Ephesians, that you might grasp how wide and long And how high and deep is the love of Christ for you? Well, grace humbles us. Grace produces love. And thirdly, grace frees us. It frees us from the pressure to succeed and to achieve. You see, grace means that there's nothing that I can lose. I don't need to achieve. I don't need to perform because... I have everything given to me freely from God. I can't lose anything. I won't miss out on anything because I'm a child of grace. It frees us from that works mentality that somehow we can do enough to please God. It humbles us to realize it's all of God and not of us. The fourth thing grace does is it motivates us for service. Notice what flows from Peter's reinstatement by Jesus. Verse 15, feed my lambs. Verse 16, take care of my sheep. Verse 17, feed my sheep. And then in verse 18 and 19, a declaration about how Peter is going to die. Grace motivates us to do the work of Jesus for Jesus' sheep. They're not our sheep. Our ministry is to do the work of the shepherd. We're under shepherds, but to do the work of the shepherd. It's a reinstatement to now have the responsibility to teach the word of God, to point people to Jesus. It's interesting to go under uh, St. Peter's Church in Rome. If you go far enough down, it's uh, hard to get to. It's way, way, way down. You can actually get to see the bones of St. Peter, or so they claim. They are there because the symbolism is meant to communicate that the church, the Catholic church, was founded upon St. Peter. Well, I'm not sure about that, but perhaps it's better to think of those bones surrounded by the rock. Because Peter was the rock that Jesus built his church upon. And he did it through Peter's testimony about Jesus and his service, the way that Peter took the word of God and ministered to those he talked to. 
along with the other disciples, along with generations of other disciples who testified to the truth of the gospel to which we now belong. You see, what happened to Peter after this encounter with the risen Lord Jesus? Well, the truth is he never recovered from God's grace. And he gave himself in service, a service that would ultimately lead to his untimely and horrific death because of that grace and to the glory of God. How about you? Have you ever recovered from God's grace? I desperately hope that you would say to me that you haven't. Does that grace make you more gracious to others because God first showed grace to you? Are you willing to forgive those who hurt and offend you because Jesus has forgiven you so much more? Is your reason for serving here at church motivated by your understanding of how profoundly you have sinned, but how deeply you have been forgiven? Since you became a Christian, how has grace, God's grace, permeated your life, your character, your goals and your ministry? I want to finish uh, with a, uh, by sharing a video uh, that we made in preparation for our Easter services um, that we decided that we're going to hold back until this week because it so clearly shows the, uh, the difference Jesus' grace had on Caleb's life. Caleb's a member of our SNC congregation, got baptised at the end of last year. Caleb was somebody that knew Jesus, was um, uh, followed Jesus, was part of the youth ministry here at this church and then walked away try to find life in other things, but then came back only last year and have a look at the difference that made um, of coming back to Jesus had, the difference that grace makes when you understand it and when you put it into your life. This is the story of Caleb Go. I'm Caleb. I'll go to Menai Anglican. Uh, I love any bit of footy, soccer, anything sport related that's just going to get me outside moving around. Uh, I'm a big gardener and I'm in a family of seven. Life before Jesus was just a constant search for, I guess, nothing. Yeah, always grabbing worldly pleasures just to fill a gap. It was just a constant search and just in a dark place, I guess, at a time. I always knew who Jesus was and I was with him for a bit, but I turned away for a little while. After an invitation to a small Bible study, I really changed my heart to people that were in around it. They were there to build me up and uh, kind of grow and be by my side no matter what I was doing on the outside and just how I guess I was beforehand they were just happy I was there and I just had something in my heart I just couldn't understand why they would treat me like this and so I decided to investigate I guess more into why they were like this but also the main reason behind it uh, and then investing more into Jesus and trying to learn more and finding real truth behind it. Uh, it's the best, man. I think just the relationships that I've built, um, it's, it's something so special. It's just so much happiness and um, life behind meeting him. It's just relationship and I think trying to model my character off him, he just, I don't know, it's the best. still with him because there's truth there's plenty of truth behind it um, I look at every the world today and I look at how broken it is and just other disciples of Christ and um, there's something different about uh, the Christian community and we're here modeling Christ and just the message that he sent us but also him dying on the cross he's genuinely saved me as a broken person wandering um, and I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Andrew. Um, thank you so much to Caleb for, for sharing that. And uh, thanks for Stefan opening up God's Word. We finished John's Gospel. It took three years to finish John's Gospel. That's the length of the ministry of Jesus um, with his disciples. You want to know what happens next? Next term, doing the book of Acts. So looking forward to that. And uh, a holiday series on, on one of the most practical books in the New Testament, James, we're doing. So look forward to that as well. Um, do you relate to Peter? I reckon there's a few of us, probably many of us, who actually relate a lot to Peter and the times we failed Christ and, uh, and just being reinstated uh, by, by Christ's grace as well. And um, this we're about to share together in the Lord's Supper, an opportunity for us to come to the Lord, not on the basis of our own good works, but on the basis of what Christ has done, to proclaim his death and resurrection, uh, which we did last weekend, but we're going to do again right now proclaim his death and resurrection. If you didn't receive one of these little packs, hey, pop your hand up upstairs. There's quite a few upstairs. Keep them up nice, and, and there's people heading them around, and uh, make sure everyone gets one. Um, this is for anyone who, who can answer the question, do you love Christ? Has he first loved us? But do you love Christ, and do you want to commit to Christ as one of his disciples? If that's you, then take and eat and share with us in just a moment. Let me just remind you of what happened that very, first, that very first night. And I've got some verses from 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we're going to do that in just a moment. Let's, uh, let's, let's humble ourselves before God. One way of doing that is, is, is through prayer. And we might pray the Lord's Prayer together. Um, Peter said, God's word says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So let's put that into practice now, calling on a heavenly father for his will, his kingdom, his way. Let's pray together. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I just want to take a moment getting ready, opening up, taking the piece of bread, opening up for the grape juice. Father God, thank you for these gifts of of bread and grape juice. We pray for us as we eat them and we drink them, that we remember, we may proclaim to ourselves that Christ is, is, is died and Christ is risen, and that we might commit ourselves as his disciples. And Father, we pray that you strengthen us reminding ourselves that we depend on him, not ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So brothers and sisters, take and eat this remembering that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with great thanksgiving. Amen. And drink this remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins and be thankful. Let's pray. To Jesus Christ, who loved us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and who made us to be a kingdom of priests serving our God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
we're going to stand and sing. Would you mind, um, visual team, popping up the verse two of the first song? I just wanted to draw us back to Stefan's sermon. It's, I was dead in the grave. You guys got it. I was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. He rolled the stone away. And then our chorus goes, amen, amen. I'm alive, I'm alive because he lives. And I was just thinking, I'm spiritually alive. We don't say because I'm a good person. I'm alive, I'm alive because I've done a lot of good works. I'm alive, I'm alive because I'm better than that person over there. Or I didn't murder anyone or it's not like that. And it wouldn't be worth singing about, would it? But we're singing about... Um, that we are spiritually alive, he, he's given us life, um, and not because he lived, but because he lived, died, and rose again, and he lives now, interceding for us. Um, so we'll go back to the start of the song. Um, please stand, please join with us um, as we sing. I believe I believe in the risen one I believe I overcome By the power of his blood Amen, amen Because he lives, amen, amen. Let my song join the one that never ends, because he lives. I was dead in the grave. Was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. He wrote the story. Thank you. 
wander thy path throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. is our God. Uh, can I encourage you to take a seat uh, as we reflect on that? And, and I hope you picked it up in uh, Caleb's interview, how gripped he was by the grace he'd received. He's turned to him and he has life, life to the full, life found in Jesus. How exciting is that, that someone amongst us has come and bowed the knee and turned to Christ? Uh, we seek to see people do that every week. Um, and so I hope you've been encouraged and also challenged this morning uh, through what Stefan had to say. Um, if you've got questions about anything that was said this morning, I'm sure Stefan or Andrew would love to chat with you. Uh, the formal part of our morning is over, um, but I, can I encourage you to um, share in those conversations that you started throughout our service. Uh, there's tea inside, coffee outside. 
Uh, there is children to pick up, but you've got a little bit of time. Um, and yeah, I hope you're filled with the joy of knowing that we have life found in Jesus. Thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you next week.